Happy Friday, everyone, and happy Super Bowl weekend. Welcome to WatchGuard Security Week in Review, a video podcast dedicated to quickly summarizing the biggest information and network security stories each week and to sharing some practical security advice along the way. I'm your host and all-around security professional, Corey Nockreiner, and this is the episode for the week starting January 27th, 2014. Now, before you run off to watch the Super Bowl, starring, by the way, WatchGuard's fellow Seattle-based team, the Seahawks, why don't you stick around for some security news? I'll start with a couple more updates for the Target breach. Actually, I'm not going to talk a lot about them. Just know that this week there were a couple more breach-related updates. For instance, Brian Krebs uh, disclosed some information from a security company that suggests that a popular IT management server may have had a default uh, password or dare I say, backdoor that may have contributed to the flaw. There's also some news about some fraudulent activity due to the, the target breach on credit cards, and the activity would show up as a $9.84 purchases. Finally, we learned another company called Michaels was also affected by a credit card theft. Now, rather than talking about all the details, I'll ask you to visit the WatchGuard Security Center blog. This week, I put up a very long blog post that goes through a timeline of all the target uh, breach-related uh, news, and it also talks about some learnings that retailers and other organizations can take away from what we know about the target breach so far. So be sure to check that out. In other news, we learned of a new piece of ransomware which illustrates why you probably should never pay these extortionists. The piece of ransomware is called CryptoBit. And while it's not related to CryptoLocker, it appears very similar to CryptoLocker in that it uh, encrypts a ton of important files like videos and documents and pictures on your computer. Then it asks you to pay a $50 to $500 ransom in order to get your files back. And to do this, you actually have to log on to the Onion network or Tor, go to a specific site and pay the ransom. However, the very bad twist for this malware is if you do pay the ransom, the private key they give you is a total scam. It does not work and it does not decrypt your files. So it kind of proves why you really shouldn't pay criminals these sort of extortion fees. Now the good news is it's pretty easy to find this particular ransomware with popular AV products like the ones WatchGuard uses. And if you back up your data, you'll be relatively safe from, from most types of ransomware. Another very interesting story from the week is how attackers actually extorted a Twitter user for his very unique Twitter name. A particular Twitter user that has the at N, a single letter Twitter name, which is very hard to get, he had to be a very early adopter, shares a very detailed story about how hackers actually stole his credentials and, and got access to his Twitter name, essentially extorting him that if he didn't give up his Twitter password, he'd be hacked. Now this relates very much to the Matt Honan story we shared a long time ago about how attackers stole his at Matt Twitter name. And I won't share all the details, rather be sure to check out the link in our blog so you can read all about this story. But as it turns out, the crux of the issue really had to do with other providers. In this case, it was via weaknesses in PayPal and GoDaddy that allowed the attackers to social engineer those tech support people into giving him enough details. The attacker essentially went to PayPal and was able to get the last four digits of this person's credit card and then was able to use that information to get GoDaddy to actually reset some information. So it's a very interesting story. I really highly recommend you check it out on the blog link. Another interesting story comes from one of WatchGuard's uh, antivirus partners, Kaspersky. They disclose details about a new piece of malware and, and botnet attack that uses cross-platform Java vulnerabilities to gain access to a bunch of victims. Essentially, I've talked about how Java is a very popular exploit platform right now, and the reason is it runs on all computers. And this particular uh, Java Trojan and botnet actually runs on three different platforms. 
platforms. It's able to run against Windows, of course, but also Macintosh and Linux. And if you get infected by this particular Java exploit, it actually uses the exploit to install a IRC bot. It actually uses a legitimate perk bot that is altered a little bit to connect your computer to IRC, and it then uses this, this channel to actually send DDoS commands to your computer so that your computer will take part in a big DDoSing uh, botnet. So a very, very interesting piece of malware. The good news is the flaw it uses has actually been patched from the middle of last year. So if you keep Java up to date, you should be very safe from this. I recommend you do keep Java up to date since attackers are going after it. But it's really interesting, and I think this illustrates a trend that attackers will be using Java more often for their exploits simply because it makes it much easier to do these sort of cross-platform attacks, and it gives them a much bigger return in investment as far as the amount of victims they can get. So the last and possibly biggest security story this week is a lot of hoopla in the security industry about some old, unpatched Oracle vulnerabilities. A researcher whose Twitter alias is Miss Sudo, named Dana Lane Taylor, actually disclosed some very uh, detailed information about some older Oracle vulnerabilities that Oracle hasn't totally patched. Essentially, a few years ago, uh, she actually found some vulnerabilities in Oracle's report server and some of the related products. And she reported these uh, vulnerabilities to Oracle. However, she goes into a lot of detail how uh, Oracle really wasn't very forthcoming in the patching process. But eventually, they did patch these vulnerabilities in Oracle report server 11G, which is the latest version. Now, according to Ms. Sudo, these vulnerabilities, however, haven't been patched in the 10G version of an Oracle report server. And this is still a very popular version, but unfortunately it's reached the end of support, meaning there's no new patches for it. So she's kind of trying to make this a big deal, saying that Oracle hasn't patched a very popular older version. And by the way, I won't go into a ton of details on these vulnerabilities. You can check out her blog to actually see videos of them, but bad guys can actually use them to get passwords from your Oracle report server if you expose it to the web publicly. And there's some videos showing how a Attackers have used Shodan and exploited these vulnerabilities to get passwords on the server. She also shows how you can use some of these file access vulnerabilities to actually put code on the Oracle report server and how this can actually allow you to get a remote shell on the server. So it's actually pretty serious vulnerabilities. Worse yet, during the week, uh, some researchers actually released exploit code for these vulnerabilities. And since then, there's actually a Metasploit exploit that makes it very easy for anyone to actually exploit these. So if you're an Oracle user, now if you're an 11G user, you're actually fine. These are mostly fixed. If you're a 10G user, however, these are not patched. Now apparently Oracle has released workarounds for 10G users. Problem is I'm not sure what they are because you need a support login to actually see them. I would suspect that some of the workarounds are ex not exposing your report server to the internet. In any case, it's actually an interesting case of a research trying to responsibly disclose something over years, but eventually having to do full disclosure with exploit code to get more attention to make sure that the, the vendor actually fixes it. Well, that's it for this week's show. I hope it was informative. And as always, you can find links to these stories and many others in our WatchGuard Security Center blog post associated with this video. And you should always follow our WatchGuard Security Center blog. For instance, this week I posted that big target roundup where I talked about some good security learnings that you can take away from this target breach. You can also follow me on Twitter. I'm at SecAdept or follow WatchGuard at WatchGuard Tech. And by the way, go Hawks! As always, thank you for watching, and here at WatchGuard, we're rooting for you.